the Joe Rogan experience. Now, when we talk about technology and you talk about the exponential increase in the powers of technology, is it possible that we could come to a point in time somewhere in the future where there's no way to encrypt anything, where it's not possible to hide things, where we won't be able to do banking online, we won't be able to have digital currency, because virtually everyone will have access to all the information. Because essentially, digital currency or anything that's encrypted, it's just information, right? It's just ones and zeros. Is it possible that technology will reach a point in time where borders and boundaries are impossible? So uh, one thing that a lot of people don't appreciate about cryptography is there's a really straightforward way to make completely unbreakable cryptography, and that's what's called a one-time pad, where if you essentially have um, you know, a long, you know, a very long set of data, and it's private as long as nobody else has it, you can encrypt anything with it, and if it was generated randomly properly, uh, you always have to worry about flaws in your random number generation or your random number source. But a properly generated one-time pad is unbreakable. Now, the problem is it's finite, so you have a fixed amount of it. And all of the really serious spycraft would use something like that, where you've got a one-time pad, you can send a message through it. In the old days when you were manually doing it, you might only have a, a book with a certain number of pages. And once it's over, it's gone, and you can't get more without returning to base. But this is always a possibility. And as we've seen storage densities increase so much, the fact that you can get a little micro SIM card that's holding hundreds of gigabytes now, which is pretty remarkable, you could imagine a world like if we did have this quantum apocalypse where all of these short 512, 1024 bit keys, whatever, all of those just get smashed irrevocably. Uh, you could imagine a world where, I mean, heck, maybe people start implanting the one-time pad inside people. So whatever, you know, whatever you need to encrypt that's coming from you has this, uh, you know, this clear, unbreakable key that you're working with. Do you think that we're going to have things implanted in our body soon that, that allow you to interface with computers or technology or wireless internet? I think that it's possible that it will, I, it would... We have people that want to do that right now. In I fact, saw a that woman, was she implanted a Tesla chip in her arm <laughs> so that she could just get close to her car and the door would open. So, in fact, one of the things that uh, talking with the Neuralink people, the idea that, of course, right now you start off, you say you take somebody profoundly disabled and you put them in a laboratory and you try to train them how to use this. But we were all saying that, well, what you really need is a programmer to get this interface. You need to be able to let a programmer actually program themselves on their interface and you will make a hundred times more progress than this you know, previously disabled person coming into the lab for a couple hours a day. And it was funny, the conversation there where uh, one of their guys was like, yeah, we'll give them the basic rules so they don't stroke themselves out. I'm like, okay, yeah, that's kind of important. Talk about health and safety rules there. Mm. But uh, yeah, if you start getting a programmer in there that starts running this, so like, all right, instead of just going through these basic exercises they run everybody through, you really understand exactly what you're doing and you change it, you write the code as you're experiencing it. And there are probably people volunteering that are ready to go do that, to have something like that. I read an article sometime after that about one of the early uh, neurosurgeons that did implant himself with some electrodes. He had to go to one of these uh, fringe countries that didn't have any uh, ethical guidelines around the, the medical practices or whatever, but he paid a neurosurgeon in one of those countries to implant an electrode into his head and he even had some complications afterwards. It was like, now there's a dedicated researcher. Sure. Although interestingly, there, there's a whole history of a lot of medical science where you would get people that would wind up having the conviction to do the experiments on themselves. And you know, you've got to respect that where it's one thing to you know, make a grant proposal to set up a study to do all of this. And it's another one to say, damn it, I am so confident in this. I'm going to have someone cut a hole in my skull and implant this mm. in me so we can learn the lessons. What was his complications? Do you remember? Uh, he had some uh, some problems with speech afterwards. Oh, he Jesus. had to learn how to do that. Like half of his face had a little bit of a sag to it from the putting oh it in there. God. So yes, it was life affecting changes as a result of going with that. Do you and this his was name? I don't offhand, uh, but it this was it was a Wired article I think from a number of years back. But this was like a single electrode, and it was just doing very one bit or one analog value computation. And he had a little transponder kind of put in under the skin of his skull, had a big lump on his head uh, mm. with that. While interesting, again, the, the Neuralink stuff, all modern high tech, where you kind of power it with RF through the skull, and it's got a little plug and I. One of the first 
when Elon first kind of approached me about uh, kind of talking with them about that, the idea and the thinking, which was kind of insightful, was this idea that the I.O. levels that they were doing on the Neuralink or they were planning on doing with that was fairly close to what we do on virtual reality, where, OK, we've got theoretically maybe up to a million inputs here and a million outputs. And I can run those numbers and say, well, that's kind of like the cameras that we're taking in and the display that we're uh, we're putting out. And I made the point that, well, you probably could run that off of like a Qualcomm chip that we've got in here. You'd set it all up as like turn them into what are called MIPI lanes for the input and output, make the inputs look like a camera and make the outputs look like a display screen. And you could then run software on something like what we use here to drive your brain. Like the programmer could then kind of start running some of those experiments with it. 